get to the world. Think about how it could be. A new mindset has arrived. Where to share has become our greatest power. It is this energy that guides us and will enlighten us. Where meaning and purpose is a plane. Burn tight ever so on the planet. Welcome to the human to human model. Uniting and inspiring leaders globally. To build together with meaningfulness and joy. Opening new possibilities for people. Anticipating disruption. Rethinking society. Who will reach their potential because the teacher is today? Join us to be sustainable plus 112. <laughs> I think right now is clearly the way to act. Lack of clean energy will affect the Earth's core later. I find that when people begin making small changes, they gradually get bigger because they get this feeling, I am doing something. So we moved from greed-based civilization to human-value-based civilization. Making money is a happiness. Making other people happy is a super happiness. Wondering about your future? So we your DNA plus today. Okay, so good afternoon everybody and welcome to our session dedicated to Africa. My name is Roger Arico, I'm the head of International Institutional Affairs of Enel Green Power, which is the Italian multinational company fully dedicated to the promotion and development of renewable energy which happens to be nowadays one of the biggest renewable energy private player in the world. My job consists in meeting governments and institutions and institutional stakeholders around the world uh, to build up, let's say, a proper regulatory, legislative and policy framework in order to boost as much as we can renewables and to promote sustainability according to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. I have a large experience on the African continent. I'm also vice president of all the Italian industry in Africa. And within the Clean Tech Business Club, I'm also vice chair of Africa. That's why today I will moderate this, this session. Well, we can start by saying that uh, very recently, uh, African Union um, reveals um, that uh, about almost 20 million jobs are at risk because of the uh, coronavirus pandemic. Actually, most of the African, uh, African economies are uh, somehow projected to shrink this year because of the, of the pandemic. Africa actually is, uh, even though it's the less impacted geography in the world by the virus, uh, tells us that uh, the economies uh, locally are facing a crisis. So we have the World Bank that is projecting that Sub-Saharan Africa will go into recession for the first time in a quarter of a century this year. And according, according to the World Bank, the region's economy could be contracted by 2% up to 5%. And finally, uh, we have the Africa Development Bank that is um, uh, studying the uh, GDP loss that Africa can have, which is between 22 billion up to 88 billion of dollars in the worst case scenario. So uh, these is are numbers that are obviously tremendous, but if we have a look specifically to um, the renewable energy sector, we can see easily that COVID-19 has had uh, an immediate uh, significant impact on the development of renewable energy in, in the Africa con continent. Why? Because industry is facing obviously uh, many challenge challenges, let's say, uh, to project deadlines due to the impact of the COVID-19 on both the labor force and also overall the pressure on the global, global supply chain. And also we can tell that in Africa, smaller renewable energy companies are particularly vulnerable more than big ones, obviously. Second, we have the big issue of the access to reliable and sustainable energy in Africa, which obviously is becoming crucial this time because of the pandemic. Why? Because obviously millions of people are now serviced by health facilities that don't have access to electricity. So what we need is uh, some, somehow a short-term approach um, by governments that can stimulate policies and packages in order to face, obviously, the, the, the challenge that renewable energy sector is uh, um, having nowadays in Africa, together with long-term, obviously, uh, um, policies that can somehow boost renewables in the future. 
And finally, um, we don't have to forget uh, the issue of climate change because obviously governments are now focused on uh, um, mitigating the effects of the COVID-19, but they don't have to abandon the climate change commitments, which, which all obviously are crucial and we will be crucial. So otherwise, we will uh, lose all the efforts that we're making now nowadays. So I will start by giving the floor to our honorary chair, which is Leila Ben Ali. Uh, Chief Economist, uh, Strategy, uh, Energy Economics and Sustainability of Apicorp, the Arab Petroleum Investment Corporation, by asking her if um, she can actually update us on what exactly oil and gas company, the majors on, of oil and gas are doing nowadays to cope with COVID-19 and how actually they can somehow uh, rethink of uh, exploring new businesses models in order to invest in renewables and oil uh, and, and, and clean tech technologies. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Leila Ben Ali. I'm Chief Economist and Head of Strategy at uh, Apicorp, which is the Arab Petroleum Investment Corporation, among other things. And I also have have also been very in, very much involved in uh, the energy sector of the last 20 plus years uh, in the Middle East, in Africa, and a few other regions in the world. Rogero was very right to say that even if the numbers when it comes to the pandemics are, are relatively uh, uh, low in Africa compared to the rest of the world, the economy is definitely taking a big hit. And, and that's, that's a dilemma that we see, I think, in, in many countries uh, across, the, across the globe. So it's, it's very much... Uh, a global issue that is having uh, unprecedented, very much unprecedented implications. And that's the thing that I think everybody is grappling with, including uh, in the oil and gas sector. Um, you asked me to say a few words about uh, the perception and the, 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 the role of, of oil and gas companies and as investors in, in the clean energy space and renewable space. Uh, two things that I would want to mention there. I mean, the first one is it's not new that some several oil and gas companies have over the last, I would say, 10 years included in their portfolio uh, a wide array of clean energy investments. Now, it's true that uh, things being, uh, being uh, very much relative, the share of investments, uh, uh, and I will put in clean energy, everything including renewables, is relatively small. Uh, but part of that is not, it's not only, it's not because of a, of, of a lack of, of interest or, uh, or because of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of lack of interest in their strategies, but also it's mainly because oil and gas projects, as you know, are very heavily capital intensive compared to uh, renewables and, and other uh, projects, I would say, related to energy efficiency and clean, clean energy in general. So today we are in um, April 2020. Uh, the 20th of April, things are changing by the day. I'm sure you are, uh, you are uh, very much aware of uh, the things that are happening in the market. And I would say that, that there are two things that are affecting investors' behavior, including, uh, including the oil and gas type. Uh, first, as you all know, uncertainty is at the highest level uh, today. And uncertainty is at the highest level because the people that we usually turn to, aka economists, uh, just don't know how to model uh, the, the situation we have today. They don't know how to model pandemics as wars. They don't know how to model pandemics as uh, events, as something other than a one-off event that does not have a long-term long -term structural impact on your productive capacity. And here I'm talking about energy or the wider, the wider economy. So from that perspective, I, I would say uh, that because of that, uh, not knowing how to model a pandemic. And, and I think the, the, the numbers that you have cited on Africa, um, uh, the GDP growth rates, the, the, the loss in, in value that we might see um, in Africa and the rest of the world, my concern is that we might, that the hole actually is much deeper than that. And that's something that institutional investors and oil and gas investors are also watching very carefully. There are now, when it comes to oil prices, which is usually the guidance, when it comes to how much money you will put in investments. Uh, there is today, I think, a broad consensus that the decline in oil prices is something that was driven by the surplus buildup that you had before the COVID-19 pandemic and by the demand contraction, which is, may I remind you, uh, potentially the largest oil demand contraction in history that we had in the second 
quarter of 2020, and we were talking about less uh, negative 22 million barrels a day uh, a drop in, in second quarter of 2020. Uh, and and there are, there's a lot of consensus about other things. I, I won't dwell into the details of that, but the thing on which we are, don't have a consensus is, uh, sorry to use the Barbanian word of, of demand elasticities. We don't know how, we don't know the length of the crisis. Yeah. We don't know whether people are going to, uh, uh, whether we don't know whether policies, whether governments are going to pursue uh, uh, coordinated policy actions to, to, to reopen the economies. Uh, and we don't know the potential structural behavior, behavioral change on the demand for oil and gas products. So that is driving today, I would say, the, the long-term view or the medium to long-term view of, of oil and gas players. So there are two things that they are concerned about. The first thing is uncertainty at the high level. And second thing is the bearish metrics that, that we, we are all uh, concerned about. A couple of numbers, and I'll finish on that. In the previous downturn, previous oil price downturn, you didn't, you didn't have the combination of an economic crisis, health crisis, and potentially a financial crisis. Uh, in the previous downturns, oil and gas companies have cut in 20, between 2015 and 20, 2016, 25% of their capex year on year during two consecutive years. Uh, and a large part of that was actually across the board in oil, gas, utilities, renewables, and the rest. Uh, today, I'm afraid that this cut is starting in 2020. Now, the good news for the renewable side of the story is that oil and gas has been, oil and gas projects are taking the hit uh, first. And uh, I'm, I'm, there, there might be actually a, a blessing in disguise for, for renewables projects, particularly for, for oil and gas companies, because they also have to prepare for the energy transition, the wider energy transition uh, the challenge that, that they will face once this crisis is over. With that, I'll stop there. I think I, I, I spoke too much for uh, what I was supposed to, 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 to speak. Uh, and I'll leave you with these thoughts about uh, the current thinking in, from oil and gas producers. Absolutely, very, very interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, before you leave, I have just one question, which is related to, it is true that oil and gas company nowadays, they are positioning themselves on the renewable energy markets, as, as we were mentioning. But how do you see the cooperation between um, somehow clean tech technologies and oil and gas company, especially or somehow if they can collaborate on a large scale. I mean, how oil and gas companies in this new uh, era can cope with clean tech technologies? Yeah, I think this is, uh, I think, an excellent question because one of the things that, and I, you all know that, um, uh, one of the things that, uh, that we have experienced in, in this crisis is, uh, is, is the power of, of IT and networks and, and transparency in, in, in data. So uh, uh, I've, 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 been, I've been in touch with, uh, with, uh, with technology companies who were mainly looking into how to leverage uh, to blockchain technologies and, uh, and things like that, the internet, internet of things to, to uh, I would say, induce some transparency in oil and gas markets. Now, we, I, I, I see a small change and a small shift into uh, a strategy to be able to uh, look into uh, operational issues. Uh, and that would be, I think, the, these are areas where uh, clean tech utilities and oil and gas companies can work together because the, the solutions, I would say, would be the same to decrease costs decrease energy costs uh, and, and to improve efficiencies uh, in processes. And I think this is an area where we can definitely, there can definitely be a lot of work. Another area which I think is a bit more difficult to achieve is anything, uh, well, as we call behind, I mean, uh, behind the meter. I mean, anything related to what the consumer is, is doing and how the consumer is consuming energy. Uh, be it, uh, I mean, electricity coming from, from renewables or, or from other sources, uh, uh, including, including oil and gas. So that's another area that I feel uh, uh, potentially clean tech and, and energy companies as a whole can contribute at, but then it, it, it creates, I would say, other issues related to uh, relinquishing uh, the data on, 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 on private consumption which uh, I, I think we're still 
uh, debating, uh, particularly in Europe. Uh, and do you see this in Africa easily? Sorry? And do you see this in Africa easily, or do you think it will require more time than other geographies? I think it's already happening in Africa. There, there are a few areas where we already see, uh, here again, driven mostly by startups who are trying to, uh, uh, to, uh, to get into uh, the area. Now, the issue in Africa is that because you have that discrepancy between decentralized distributed generation and distributed utilization of energy uh, in, in some countries and in other countries, you have totally centralized energy system. Uh, and then you get into uh, the inability of some of, of some startups or, or or tech companies to scale up when when they are a totally decentralized system. Yes. So I think the trick is to be able to to reach that balance between uh, between decentralized and, and centralized energy systems. And I think that would be the uh, there, then we can see some winners, particularly in Africa. Absolutely. So thank you very much for your time. I, don't, I know that you have to run away. Thank you very much. So you will be able to see actually this session live uh, uh, on YouTube. So please have a look whenever you will have time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leila. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Leila, Enjoy your meeting. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, Sorry, Leila. Just, thank you. Thank you very much. You are leaving. Yes, thank you. So thank, thank you so much. And then uh, I hope that uh, you will unite your DNA together with us. Yes. And uh, we'll also invite you to Empowering Women Initiative, yes, because for us, as you notice with, uh, with Zineb, uh, it's so important initiative, and I think it's one of the very important initiatives also for Africa and for the Middle East. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. So now let me, let me also introduce, uh, because I see them in our wheelchair room, the chairs of um, uh, Africa for CDS. So the first one is Mansour Diagne. Mansour, I, I hope you're there, uh, who is the MEA director at Uni, Uni Vergi. Uh, and the second one is Jalel Amila, vice president for Middle East and Africa at GA Solar. So hello. Mm -hmm. uh, Jalel, you want to say something before we start with our discussion uh, the, uh, in the panelists? Sure, yeah. Uh, thank you. I would like to thank all the uh, speakers uh, for uh, the invitation and um, uh, I just uh, wanted to, you know, highlight uh, the importance, I think, of Africa and this uh, clean tech future uh, uh, market that we are seeking. Uh, I think if we look at, uh, you know, obviously we have a lot of challenges that uh, Rogero and the uh, previous speaker talked about, you know, with the COVID-19 impact uh, on all, uh, you know, different uh, um, issues uh, might rise right now and probably in the short term. Uh, but on the bright side, I think right now, if you look at the uh, ARENA data on the installations of renewable energy, uh, it's very important to, you know, to, to mention that uh, we have about uh, 50 gigawatt of renewable energy. Most of it is about 70% is obviously hydro, uh, but uh, we, we still have about, you know, eight gigawatt of uh, solar and six gigawatt of wind and about two gigawatt of uh, biomass. And that's really very important. I know that, uh, you know, the challenge in Africa is completely different than uh, other continents. Uh, on top of that, uh, obviously we have more than 50 countries with different, you know, uh, uh, challenges, different uh, uh, cultures, different infrastructures. So all that makes it more uh, challenging to address uh, these different countries. And I think it's very important for us to share knowledge, to, uh, uh, to inseminate, you know, experiences and know-how uh, within Africa and outside Africa. And uh, this platform is, you know, and this initiative is uh, really to achieve that goal to accelerate uh, the clean tech uh, adoption. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Jalele. What we can say is actually that if all together we are somehow sending the same messages towards Africa, it will help a lot. So if we can also through our club build up one single voice and impose actually what are our views uh, in order to um, uh, relaunch African economy, I think it will be absolutely useful. Maybe it's time to start our discussion with the panelists. Uh, I would start with Tony Tio. Tony, are you there? Yes who is founder, CEO, and editor-in-chief of Renewable in Africa. 
if uh, uh, Tony, you can give us a broad, actually, overview of what are uh, your views on the development of the renewable energy market in Africa, and also the perspective from you uh, as a, a journalist somehow. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thanks for that. Thanks for that, um, Rogero. So, uh, just a very brief uh, description. So, renewables in Africa, we are actually a two-in-one company, as well as being the media platform providing uh, awareness about the sector in Africa. We are also very much a, an engineering company, so providing uh, services to uh, to developers and and and, and investors. So that's just on the side to, uh, for, for who we are. I think, uh, first of all, thank you for uh, inviting me to this platform today. It's very impressive. I, ha I have to say congratulations to Thomas and all the people who put together effort to organize them. So um, we're talking about, uh, obviously, a COVID-19 uh, COVID situation for Africa. That's a situation like uh, Leila was saying, nobody could foresee that coming or maybe to that scale for Africa. And it's quite surprising because... Uh, not long ago, we ran um, a podcast interview of, um, let's say, uh, a very good speaker from uh, from Jay Sola. I'm so jealous we know him, who was already warning us of what was going on in China. And I remember at the time, I, I, I we ran it. Obviously, the rest of the world was not in the situation where we are, where we were now. And it was very important for us because we could see that it was having a tremendous impact on China and China being the factory of the world still to this day. So it was important uh, It was important to know that. Now it looks like we are now seeing what the effect uh, uh, is. And in terms of the, uh, the impact on the, uh, on, the, on the African continent, I think we're still getting to understand uh, what it is as the, the, the crisis is developing. Because if we're looking at the, uh, the, how, the way things are at the moment, the, the continent seems to be a little bit behind, we depend on countries, but in general, a little bit behind, uh, certainly Asia, uh, Europe, and maybe North, uh, North America. So we're still, we're still uh, uh, looking at what will happen. But clearly, what we can see is there are impacts on projects that are either in development or either in construction. It's not necessarily the same, but clearly there's going to be delays. There's going to be lots of delays on projects. I mean, for us ourselves, for example, we we involved in project, we are already seeing delays. There's gonna be lots of cancellation. Those are for people that were just talking about uh, getting into projects. So that's, uh, that's something that we will see. And, they will also, and for projects that are in construction, they may be the most affected at the moment because on top of delays, they're also gonna to have to, uh, to deal with supply issues because supply is gonna be all over the place. So that we can see definitely gonna be, going be affecting. Now, at the same time, there's gonna be lots of opportunities. So I could just mention two very quickly because I don't want to um, uh, uh, take the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the time all for myself. But two, I can see there are some sectors going to react differently. So de definitely, sector like tourism is going to be affected for now because nobody's traveling. So obviously, and if you have a project, for example, in the CNI market specifically, you're talking to uh, to uh, to a hotel, to resort, or something like that. They won't be they won't be really they will not be listening to you because at the moment they're looking at how can I first of all reduce the cost and survive. That's, the, that's one thing. On the other hand, if you're in the healthcare industry, you know that obviously that may be paradoxically one of the best times because now everybody is turning towards the sector. They know that they, they need to boost that. And we're talking about that specifically because in Africa you will have a lot of, or not enough, rural healthcare center that don't have access to electricity. So now how can you deploy that quickly? That's, uh, that's actually the key word. Because to do that quickly, you can't use the common approach, basically the, the conventional power. That's not enough. So you're going to be turning towards renewable. So that's a big opportunity that I can see. I'm just going to stop there. I think you mentioned absolutely two crucial points, because the first one is the delay on the deadlines. Actually, I can tell you that many associations, they are trying now to push on that aspect, asking government somehow an um, extension of the deadlines in order to meet 
uh, their project because of this uh, uh, delay um, due to the pandemic. And the second one is uh, that there will be many opportunities. So the fact that uh, this COVID can be somehow a disruption because we can turn into uh, positive many other uh, ideas or... Hello, can you hear me? Yes. No, you, sorry. Many other ideas or many other sectors that at the moment are absolutely under underdeveloped. Um, so thank you very much. I will now give the floor to Jean Pascal. Hello, are you there? Hello. Oh, perfect. Hello, Rogero. So Jean Pascal who is the co-founder and CEO at Scale NGO. So yep. you can also introduce yourself, and you're also within our club co-chair of Political Decision Makers Exchange Platform Task Force. Correct. Absolutely. Uh, th Thank you very much. And you can also give us an overview from the, let's say, legal perspective, uh, because it's absolutely important, uh, even if we touch briefly that aspect, how we can cope with um, the constraints, actually, from the legal point of view, from the obligation point of view that we have as companies, as investors. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for, to, to CBC for having me today. I'm uh, very happy to introduce uh, the uh, Scale.NGO organization. It's a very recent uh, NGO based in France and dedicated uh, to sustainable transitions. So what we do is we help um, solutions, uh, sustainable uh, transition solutions to, uh, to structure and scale up, uh, structuring them from, I would say, business model, uh, helping people to think of their business model, helping people to uh, think their regulatory model, uh, legal uh, framework, contractual framework, and financial uh, as well as its financial structure. Um, my background is I'm a, I'm a business lawyer and then an entrepreneur. I've uh, co-founded a, a solar company called Solar Direct, which has been pretty successful and, and uh, has been acquired by NG in 2015. And since then, through the Terawatt Initiative and now through Scale, I'm dedicating my time to helping others uh, to succeed as well. Um, so uh, what we are doing, and, and really it's important, is we are starting from project and, and, and bringing them a systemic approach using innovative and agile methodologies so that we can actually deliver quickly what, um, uh, thing, what have been a pretty uh, slowly done for the moment especially on the, the regulatory discussions or the legal discussions, which uh, are always uh, very cumbersome, very difficult to, to bring. Uh, and, and there are solutions and there are methodologies to, to accelerate that, and especially in, in situation of crisis like, like the COVID is bringing. We are active worldwide. We are uh, present in energy, water, waste, and, and, and smart cities. And, and we have a focus as the, uh, on health, uh, we have um, and I will be now introducing uh, a project that we are supporting. Uh, it's a joint initiative with uh, uh, another NGO um, uh, called uh, the NET uh, Training uh, in Health Equity Network. Uh, it's a U.S. Uh, it's an American uh, organization, um, uh, but uh, with a, a wide network of hospitals in in, in the world, especially in Africa. And what we are doing, we are, uh, we are working with uh, Denis Mukwege uh, in DRC. Uh, Denis Mukwege is the 2018 uh, Peace Nobel Prize winner. He's, uh, he's a surgeon, he's a gynecologist. He's very uh, famous for saving uh, women uh, in, in, in his DRC, uh, which have been victim of uh, war crimes. And, uh, uh, and, and what we have uh, we're, what we are working together on is the fact that uh, exactly what you said, uh, Tony, uh, um, we, uh, we, we see that there is a huge issue uh, in the healthcare systems uh, in, in Africa in particular, but not only, um, uh, where the hospitals are, miss, are lacking uh, energy, but they are also lacking uh, clean water and they are also lacking uh, waste uh, management, uh, medical waste management. And, and especially in infectious disease, uh, it, it's a huge, uh, it's a, waste is a huge issue. So 
what we are saying is that yes, we actually all the technologies necessary to bring these services to hospitals exist. Um, these technologies can't, these services can't generally uh, be provided, especially in rural area, areas by the communities around the hospitals or ho around the health uh, centers because the, the communities themselves don't have that. And, one, uh, and, and the approach we have is to say, why not uh, shifting completely the thinking and start by places which are very important like hospitals and health centers to provide them with affordable uh, energy, water and uh, waste management uh, and and structure this offering of services in a way that is easily scalable. And what does that mean? What we know is, as the technology is available uh, and, and we know how uh, uh, how to structure that, the main issue is the speed of delivery, is the transaction processes, and the financing. And uh, from a financial perspective, even if for, for all these hospitals and health care centers, uh, investment of uh, 500,000 uh, US dollars or, 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 or a little more uh, is a huge investment uh, for the financial, uh, on the financial side, it's not uh, uh, big enough. So there is here a mismatch and the idea, the whole idea underlying the utility, uh, which is the name of the, of the of the of the initiative you uh, like uh, YouTube, but utilities uh, is to say we need to uh, bring together all the hospitals in the continent in every country and ask uh, and uh, organize their demand so that they ask uh, the same kind of technologies, the same kind of services, and when it comes to electricity, water, and and waste uh, management, it, it's it's pretty much the same everywhere. Um, and uh, to pool this demand, to make it credit worthy, and then to go to the market and ask uh, for a supply, uh, 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 has, has the supply side to, to, to give better offers so that you can very rapidly and very competitively, because the affordability challenge is the main and the most important one. If it's not affordable, people will not do it because they can't. Uh, by bringing all the hospitals together and giving them what is the, I would say, legal and financial thinking necessary to work together and to, to, sub, to, to procure their services, their basic services, their basic utilities together is the way to accelerate uh, the supply and to accelerate it in an efficient structural um, systemic manner so that uh, they get they get the benefit of, of these services and then create a much more resilient health system across the continent and that's essential and so we are very proud to work with the new on, on on that and, and and we are really hoping that we can develop this this uh, this uh, model and, and 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 give it uh, to uh, to the to the stakeholders in the, on the continent very interesting. Thank you, Jean Pascal. So I would retain that at the end of the day, um, providing a, a public financial su support will be extremely important in, in the in the in the next uh, in the next months. Do you agree? Um, I, I, would, I would. That's that that's a very um, difficult question mm -hmm. uh, for for the governments because they are uh, struggling with priorities and they have a, a very limited fiscal uh, space. Uh, so the question is how they are going to, uh, how can they better leverage their, on their public money in order uh, to help private capital to flow in uh, and to do what is needed to do without, um, without um, jeopardizing too, too heavily uh, the public, the public, uh, the public uh, system. And, and for that, there are a lot, or not all, actually there are not a lot, but there are very well-known um, legal and financial structures, which are generally called de-risking structure or de-risking instruments uh, that are uh, leveraging on public money and, and, and catalyzing uh, private investment. And, but that requires also for the governments to understand that they, and the governments and 
and, and the, the buyer and the demand side in general, that they need to uh, rethink uh, and improve the way they are uh, procuring this kind of uh, sustainable infrastructure services as, and commodities, as, as we call them, uh, which, uh, which requires uh, actually to think public-private partnerships in a different manner. Um, so public money is important, public investment, um, the, pu the public will not be able to, to invest ev on everything and they need to use very wisely uh, the public resources in order to, yeah, to, to, to make, to make, uh, to make the, the, to leverage and to catalyze the private sector money. Yeah, absolutely. Knowing that also, uh, according to the recent Africa Union study, up to 50% of foreign direct investments can easily disappear you know, from abroad to Africa. And at the same time that African governments, uh, according to this study, could lose from 20 to 30% of their fiscal revenue. And that last year it was estimated around 500 billion of dollars. So uh, again, we are talking about huge numbers. So if somehow you know, they don't receive money and the ones, the one they have, they don't allocate this amount, you know, to, for instance, infrastructures like the one you said, then obviously uh, we won't have, you know, many um, opportunities. Yes, but uh, on that, uh, and I, I will finish on that, um, I think what is really important is to understand where the money comes from. Um, and, and, and the way the direct investment have been made for so far um, is either by development finance, uh, or uh, for uh, investment for, by, by industry, industry players for their own settlement. Uh, but there, are, there is a, a huge pocket of money, which is the institutional investors, especially the pension funds uh, in, the, in the developed countries, which is struggling uh, for, 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 for finding, uh, I would say, a, a good investment and long-term investment. And, uh, and they have affordable capital. The, 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 the thing is that, that there is a... A, a, a risk uh, profile gap between what they can invest in and what uh, for the moment uh, infrastructure investment is considered to be in Africa. And this gap is precisely what the, the de-risking instruments need to, to fill so that uh, the, the, the private, the, the, the institutional uh, uh, capital can flow into, uh, in, into sustainable infrastructures in Africa and everywhere, actually, because the situation of Africa is, is maybe the most critical, but it, it's, it's Hello? transition as yes, a whole. Mansour, yes, Mansour, wait a moment. Um, sustainable transition uh, and investing in sustainable infrastructure is a, is a, it's a global problem. Uh, and and, and, uh, and the, the, the public money really it needs to fill this gap, and it doesn't necessarily to to be cashed out, but it's there is it's really smart use of the risking thinking. Absolutely, thank you, thank you very much. Very interesting and inspiring. Uh, so now I see finally joining our chair for Africa, Mansour Diagne. Mansour, are you there? I'm here. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Mansour Diagne. Um, I'm Senegalese, living in Japan, and I'm uh, working at University as the commercial director for Africa and Middle East. Um, uh, I was the first African to join the team. I'm very much worried about what's going to happen uh, next in Africa, mm -hmm. in terms of how many people will be con uh, infected, how many people will die, because what happened in Europe and in France, in USA, in developed countries, Imagine if that happened in uh, underdeveloped countries, uh, which includes uh, uh, many African countries. Um, uh, the situation will be overwhelming. Uh, up to now, uh, things are not out of hands. Um, let me give you a small example about uh, Senegal, for example, the situation. Uh, Jean Pascal, uh, uh, all French people, I think you know about uh, DJ Raoul. Professor Di um, uh, we are apply, uh, applying the treatment he advised in Senegal. And it seems to be working because the um, recovery rate is the highest in all Africa. But 
um, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Um, in Africa, for example, today I watched in Senegal, some people who came that, uh, out said they cannot, they, 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 they can no longer stay home because they have to work in order to, to, to eat. Um, uh, so my knowledge is limited in, uh, in, in, the, in what's happening in, in, in the society. I mean, I'm not a, an economist, so I, I, I don't allow myself to talk about uh, economically what's going to uh, happen. But I know that socially there will be a lot of uh, problems if this continues. Yeah, absolutely. So let's say that the impact, the social impact of, uh, of this uh, pandemic can be extremely dangerous mm. if it's not contained. So yes. obviously, let's say that the policy that should be stimulated uh, also mm -hmm. have to embrace this aspect because uh, the impact mm -hmm. on, the, on, on the social um, mm. African countries can be absolutely important. Uh, thank mm -hmm. you very much, Mansoor. Uh, so I will give now the mic to Hamed Meziou. If you can give us your perspective and actually how uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, can impact uh, overall the African renewable energy market. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's great, uh, great, great pleasure to spend uh, this afternoon with distinguished uh, speakers and attendees. Uh, thank you very much, Thomas, and all members of the organizing committee uh, for organizing this outstanding event. So um, the impact actually of COVID-19 on the financing, well, Let's say I mean the impact actually of COVID-19 on uh, like on existing renewable energy projects. So here actually we have to differentiate between the project under construction and the project under operations. So for the project under construction, I think the disruption that is faced by COVID-19 great situation, uh, which have resulted into delays in meeting key constructions and work milestones um, or defaults under the funding arrangement. Could have several consequences uh, like payment of liquidated damages, loss of incentives, uh, the call on bonds um, for delays to construction completion, maybe also termination uh, for time limits exceeded. So, so here actually what would happen is that the lenders, the developers and actually state utility of takers, they might need to, um, to pass the liability actually in consequences to contractor seek reliefs under the project documents, um, you know, if, if, if uh, for example, I mean, force majeure or actually change in law, I mean, can be, I mean, can be, can, can be claimed. So whether this uh, actually would be, whether such attempt result into successful claims, well, it all depends on actually on how robust uh, the project was structured and actually how, ro how robust the project documentation uh, 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 are. Um, for project actually under operation, I mean, the risk profile is a bit different because these are uh, projects which are actually operating. So what we have seen actually is that the governments, I mean, continue to implement new legislations and regulation in response to the consequences of COVID-19. So governments, for example, uh, I mean, in Africa, because of there is, uh, because I mean, there is a fall actually in electricity demand uh, that might be caused by the containment measures. And also maybe because of the fall in oil prices, uh, which may be seen as an opportunity actually for some African countries heavily relying like on fossil fuels, governments then might attempt to reduce electricity supply generated by independent power producers, you know, through actually issuing regulations and, and actually orders. That could be unlawful. That could be unlawful. That could not be successful. Um, IPPs actually could claim, for example, I mean, change in law uh, or actually force majeure. Um, so I'm not sure actually if I have really actually the time to actually to get into the details about force majeure and changing law and all actually this like legalistic stuff. But I want to, to jump to a very important actually matter that I think uh, which was mentioned by uh, Jean-Pascal, which is uh, uh, on the impact of COVID-19 on the financing of existing renewable energy projects, you know. So, what we have seen actually so far is that international financial institutions, developing financial institutions allocated multi-billion fast track financing to assist uh, the private sector companies and countries actually in the efforts to tackle COVID-19. So this financing package, this fast track financing package, which were deployed very, very 
actually which are being actually deployed i mean right now on a on somehow like efficient way and subject to a very light actually documentation uh, are 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 um, are, are uh, actually are providing some i mean are actually offering like some good input and actually some good relief i mean to existing projects in terms of in terms of like cash buffers uh, in terms of, like working facility as well actually to which some of the existing clients in some infrastructure projects especially in the power energy actually were entitled to receive um but um uh so in that context actually developers and lenders may need to discuss the consequences uh for of the delays uh to to construct or actually to actually to construct uh or actually to operate and also the delays actually on the funding arrangement uh because this actually may cause default early repayment restriction uh, on uh, utilization and uh Etc. So on, uh, sorry, on this, for example, asking governments to postpone the deadlines can be absolutely a good instrument, right? It is. It is. It is. And that's where and that's where actually force majeure actually could come in actually could come in play um, because I mean obviously I mean if I mean if an independent power producer uh, can prove that COVID nineteen outbreak and COVID nineteen consequences actually would qualify as a force majeure, taking actually can actually all the conditions uh, of actually force majeure beyond the control and foreseeable um, and stuff so they they can actually they can claim force majeure uh, and in that sense I mean it depends actually how it depends on the definition of force majeure it depends on the scope it depends on what are the reliefs what are the reliefs and what are the consequences actually of claiming force majeure whether I could extend uh, a certain milestone whether I can extend a certain long stop date or actually where I can also claims a compensations actually uh, i mean a compensations it depends i mean uh, like in some of the documents actually i mean i've actually i've been seeing and usually i mean what when you look to it covid 19 is usually like an epidemic or like a pandemic uh, so it's usually I mean, categorized into like other force majeure or natural force majeure and in some documents in some projects you might see a different treatment of a political force majeure or natural force majeure but however the containment measures that are being taken by the governments right now, actually currently, like the borders shut down and all actually these measures could also I mean, qualify as a political force majeure because these are the acts of government. Again, subject to verifying and taking actually all the three conditions for like a force majeure. And it depends also whether you are like in civil law jurisdiction or like common law jurisdictions, you know, because like in civil law jurisdiction, you do have like, like in Italy, in Spain, in Tunisia, in France, in Morocco, you do have a a definition of force majeure in the law, even if you don't have actually such definition clearly spelled out in the document, in your documentation, like in the PPA or concession agreement, auction implementation agreement and stuff. The other thing is the regulations that are being taken today by actually the governments, I mean, to counter, to tackle actually the consequences actually of COVID-19 could also qualify actually as change in law, because if such regulation have significant impact uh, significant impact actually on the economics of the project, significant impact on the delays, on all the milestones and everything, again, IPPs could also claim a change in law. So it all depends actually on the consequences, because I mean, there must be like a direct link, uh, a direct link between the COVID-19 the consequences and actually the delays and the prejudice that was suffered actually on your project. But again, I mean, like in terms of what I'm saying, I mean, could be like a bit, uh, I mean, could really show like a bit like of a negative, you know, like image uh, on, on, on actually what's going on. But this is actually the truth. So it's very, very disruptive, very disruptive. But at the same time, I mean, if I could just end actually on like on a positive note, these also I mean, provide some good actually opportunities. I mean, for actually IPPs to, re to renegotiate again uh, their funding and actually their financing arrangements uh, with, with actually I mean, the GFIs, IFIs actually and lenders. Because I mean, they could, for example, I mean, take advantage of the shrinking interest rate actually context actually today, and they could also, I mean, try actually to unlock the cash that they could unlock actually on their project uh, through through actually different ways. You know, I would actually I would recommend, for example, I mean, to draw actually as much as you can. I mean, I would recommend, for example, I mean, IPP is actually to draw as much as they can in, uh, on like on the uh, existing actually facilities. Because I mean, you can never know actually if, like, if actually the banks could, could I mean, somehow claim uh, a material actually adverse uh, change actually to block uh, disbursement actually drawn down. 
they could also try actually to negotiate a working capital facility, clean down. They can also negotiate bridge funding actually for future capex or actually access them, for, as I said, the blocked actually account and cash. So some, some I mean, so some opportunities actually that can be taken actually on, on, on uh, actually on board. And, it, and, this is, and this is actually a crisis, I think, that, that uh, I mean, uh, I'm building up actually on what uh, Jean Pascal actually was saying. I mean, there are a lot of like instruments actually in the market today. I mean, that, that actually can be used like effectively uh, actually to leverage. I mean, to leverage the necessary funding for uh, small scale projects or actually medium scale or even actually large scale projects, including actually with the government. I mean, the government also I mean, could help throw some sort of, you know, like sophisticated guarantee instrument actually to help also, I mean, tap on this, this like this funding. Thank you. Thank you very much. I made actually I can revert to you one question that is coming up from the audience, because uh, if somehow the Federal Reserve uh, paved the way that uh, they don't want to issue more money to the market, the thing is that we can expect somehow a loss of the valuation of the value in emerging, in emerging countries. What do you think? I mean, it is, yes, uh, one hundred percent. Actually, that's that's true. That's actually a really risk. Actually, today, I mean, especially, I mean, especially if uh, not only taken into account that most of the financing actually are in USD. Actually, today, for financing independent power production actually projects, but also, I mean, most of the EPC costs is also I mean denominated in in actually in in actually USD. And like on the other hand, actually, like with with the FX crisis that actually we are seeing right now, right now, I mean, going on with most of the local currency actually in developing jurisdictions and Africa is not an exception to that. Uh, we can see like a big gap. We can see actually a big gap, you know, a big like FX gap actually, which would, which would make things worse. So the absence of funding, so, ab so the absence of fresh money, the absence of, 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 of the whole actual rescheduling like in a way actually that you can unlock the existing cash actually in your project, I mean, to take yourself and actually to give yourself like a buffer with actually the FX risk, with the other, with, with actually the other like impediments that uh, or other distinguished speakers actually were mentioning today about like the supply chain, the broken actually supply chain actually today, uh, the massive pressure on uh, procurement, uh, the lack of visibility actually for some lenders, uh, the pressure on prices because no one really knows exactly actually what would be the like, the overreach and 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 actually I mean like the high <laughs> the end actually of like, of this uh, crisis. So all actually this lack of visibility like make things worse for everyone for all actually stakeholders. Absolutely. And well, what about and what about subsidies? Subsidies, for instance, you know, since now we have the falling oil price, maybe it's a good time to consider to removing the subsidies from the fossil fuel, you know, to use this money maybe to develop a low carbon infrastructure or uh, research and innovation that can support maybe a higher penetration of renewables. So, you know, removing fossil fuel subsidies can be also an injection of more money. Yes, it is. Uh, yes, actually it is. And, and currently actually, as we speak, I mean, I know that many, many developing countries actually were importing, were heavily importing heavily importing, uh, you know, oil and heavily relying on like fossil fuels, they are making actually some arrangement depending like on their stock, depending actually, on their, their storage actually capacity as well. So I mean, they are trying actually, to buy as much as they can actually to secure supply of actually oil, fossil fuel actually as much as they can. But again, I mean, you have to also, I mean, you have to also to understand the situation where these people are today. Because I mean, COVID-19 has created a lot of gaps like in their budgets and actually there's a lot of prefer, there's a lot of pressure actually on or like the fiscal leverage. So yes, they gained the difference. I mean, they gained actually the difference like in their forecast in terms of oil, but actually they are also facing a huge actually challenge of feeding people, providing to some like necessary actually healthcare and, and, and actually rescuing actually the economies and, and, and stuff. I mean, if we can see today, I mean, big countries like France, UK and the United States are a bit struggling. So actually what about, I mean, the others like in developing countries, in Africa, I mean, Central Africa, West Africa, North Africa, I mean, this is not really, and, and, and like on the other way, I mean, I fully agree with you, but like, but like on the other hand, I mean, I might also see it like as a way out for countries saying, look, we want really to go green, we want really, I mean, to actually to meet our 
objectives and to go green and, and, and actually to develop actually renewable energy. But at the same time, we are facing like a shortage of cash and we are facing a very, a very, very actually difficult I mean, financial situation. So, I mean, if I can find it for me actually as a country, I mean, to continue actually going on like with fossil fuel because it's cheaper and because actually that actually could make me, could actually give me like some fresh air to meet like other actually mean, liabilities, then unfortunately they will do it. Okay, thank you very much. Zineb, yes, you want to say something, please. Yes, hello, Ahmed. Uh, nice to have you on the panel. This is Zineb. So um, I just have uh, two, maybe two questions. One, a legal one regarding the force module. As you said, I mean, it depends how it is defined. You said that political issues or, you know, it might be also included in the force majeure or natural issue. Uh, I've heard like in France, the, some insurance companies, they were claiming that everything which, was, which, which were, it was rejected because definition of force majeure, like a pandemic is not included. So I um, just want to talk, talk about the legal one. Uh, do, are you struggling with this? Because we understand that force majeure is the key you know, close now in all contract, you know, EPC contract, because they are causing delays, uh, they have to find out how they can handle this. So is, is it the definition of force majeure itself? I mean, in terms of pandemic, is it yes or no force majeure? Is it raised in, in Africa, in those countries like Africa? Because I saw that in France, yes. Most of insurance companies said, sorry, we don't have pandemic as part of the uh, force majeure. So this is one legal question that I have for you. And the second one is like regarding the funding. So you were talking about like financing the current project is like they are, they have some cash buffer. So they can, let's say, overcome or let's say support to overcome this, this pandemic situation. How about new project? How about financing of, you know, in the project portfolio, let's say, is this something that is the, this financing institute or investors, equity, private equity, saying this, like, bring, uh, uh, put in this project, this new project as on hold? Or do you see some movement in terms of progress of development or any plan that they are uh, communicating by when they can, uh, work, you know, uh, work further on this financing or this new project? So, and thank you. Yes, well, thank please, you very much. Please, Hamid. Yes, well, thank you very much, Zainab, uh, actually, for the question. Very, very interesting question, actually, indeed. So, I mean, I will, so I will uh, first respond, I mean, to the first one. Uh, okay, so France, uh, I mean, I'm not actually a French qualified lawyer, actually, but, uh, but France actually has, like, a civil law, actually, jurisdiction, I think, uh, uh, has a definition of a force majeure, actually, in its laws. Um, so, I mean, even if, Again, I mean, you have to see the documents and stuff, and actually, you have to make like your own assessment, actually, of like of the existing project and the documents and and stuff. But actually, my my raw actually answer to this, even if you don't have like epidemic or actually pandemic, clearly spelled out in a definition of force majeure. If the broad definition of force majeure in the law or the broad definition of force majeure actually in the documents, if if it is there, and then you can. Uh, demonstrate that COVID-19 is an unforeseeable event which prevents um, a party from fulfilling its contractual obligation, that would likely fall within the definition of first measure. Even if you don't have a pandemic or actually epidemic clearly spelled out in the definition or scope of first measure, you know, natural actually first measure or actually whatever. So, um, we have to push back actually with insurance companies maybe actually and and uh, actually and look at that and and and, uh, and get into real actually discussion i mean to understand why actually would they really i mean why actually would they claim that uh the covid 19 actually is not covered uh because i mean no one i mean first covid 19 is actually an unforeseeable event i think none of us actually here actually would have expected like COVID-19 and its consequences like six months or actually seven months actually uh, ago. Uh, that's, that's actually for the first question. For actually the second question, I mean, I think, yes, I mean, what we are seeing actually from the market today is a clear trend to go ahead uh, with some existing projects. Uh, I mean, people actually are still working. I mean, people actually are working from home. People actually are trying to not break actually the chain. 
keep working actually in delivering. I mean, as long as they can do it, actually working from home. So, I mean, development activities actually still exist and actually development activities is still actually going on. Discussion with lenders and financing still actually going on. Uh, lenders so far actually are showing like some very positive actually attitude and appetite actually to continue, uh, actually to continue me discussing about tech projects or actually, uh, or, or, or try to expand actually existing projects into like different actually other phases. Um, again, uh, the, the, actually the advantage that actually some IPPs, I mean, could take also uh, like into account is the existing low interest rate actually environment. The existing low interest rate environment uh, could also help further optimizing the capital structure of energy infrastructure projects. Uh, and, 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 and also, I mean, even if though you know, the apocalyptic scenario, actually, I would say, uh, like the apocalyptic scenario. I mean, tomorrow, I mean, the credit is going to like to suffer like a big crunch, and actually, I mean, lenders will stop actually lending anything and 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 stuff. We still can move like to other alternatives and other actually more sophisticated. I mean, I would say more actually sophisticated, like for crowdfunding, for example. Crowdfunding for solar project, actually, wind project, even though the outreach still actually modest right now, actually in the market, but we are seeing it, and actually we are seeing. I mean, some crowdfunding platform actually. Very, very successful, by the way, and uh, financing small scale projects oh, through actually this tool. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, th there's always actually an alternative whether to leverage on the debt market or to leverage like on the equity market, like in a different form, actually to continue with that. But uh, I mean, I think the most dangerous now actually point, I mean, like the element, like in the equation that really need actually need to be taken into account is the demand and supply. So, I mean, if the demand actually is falling, I mean, whatever way you do, uh, you, you can be like very, very sophisticated actually in doing a project and stuff. But actually when there is no demand for renewable energy, for clean energy, that, that's, I think, the most critical and dangerous factor. Thank you very much, Ahmed. And so we can also say that there is, that, is why, that, is, that is why it's very important to have both you know, a short-term kind of policy that government can implement, but thinking also about a long-term and how actually after this COVID-19, we can somehow reboost our industry in terms of any kind of support that uh, policies can make uh, to our industry. Let me give now the floor because time, time is running to our last speaker, who is from Burkina Faso, Mr. Pazisnewende Cabore. Very nice to meet you. Director of the Circle, promoter the Cosiam Jesuit University of Science. So the floor is yours if you, if you want to give us your views and what actually your country somehow is facing during this uh, uh, bad time. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much, Ruggiero. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Thank you very much. So thank you uh, to Thomas and to everyone who organized this meeting and uh, uh, thank you for the participants also. So I'm from Burkina Faso and I'm talking from Ouagadougou. And I would like to share uh, three points. First, uh, the impact on uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, I'm an economist, so I would focus on the economic uh, issues. And also, uh, we have a focus on Burkina Faso, and then what I see as perspectives. Uh, Ruguero, you are just talking about uh, long-term issues. And if you don't mind to make things uh, easier, I would like to share my, um, uh, my screen with you, if yeah, it's possible. Please, please, go on. So, um, I would like to focus on the th these three points I mentioned, uh, the impact on Sub-Saharan Africa, focus on Burkina and perspectives. Um, when you look at the oil prices, and it's always already mentioned by uh, many of us, you can see that oil prices have been decreasing and are reaching the levels we had in the 70s and in the 90s. But if you look at the second graph, you will see that, yes, we have some commodities that have their prices decreasing, but some of them will be increasing. So the point is that we don't have just bad news. We have also good news. And this is about coffee, gold, and of course, anything that is the, uh, that can be a substitute for the commodities which prices are decreasing. And the basic, I mean, the most important uh, substitute for fossil, uh, fossil fuel is, of course, uh, sustainable energy. So, uh, focusing on Burkina Faso, uh, just to, to go first so that we can have questions. 
is that uh, in Burkina Faso, you can see that the increase in the accumulated, uh, the cumulative number of COVID has been increasing very sharply since March 9th. And to date, Burkina Faso, South Africa, and Cameroon are the countries the most affected. However, you can see also that the rate of increase of the healings is also increasing. It's the, the only two graphs that are increasing are the cumulative number of contamination and the healings. And as a matter of fact, and uh, my friend, uh, uh, my brother Mansoon Jai was mentioning the case of uh, Senegal, where using um, the method of Professor Raoul, they are healing people a lot. So I think there is still uh, possibilities that we, we can find solutions for this uh, disease. Now, what is the action of the government in Burkina Faso? There has been international and uh, multilateral and bilateral support. For example, the IMF has pledged uh, 115 million dollars uh, to support, uh, fiscal support for the government. They have also agreed to postpone the debt service. The AFDB, that, that's the African Development Bank, has agreed to provide $45 million support. The Development Bank of West Africa, $50 million uh, of support. And all of them have agreed also to postpone the debt service. So in terms of uh, the impact in Burkina Faso. Sorry, I have a uh, question. Sorry, I have one question. The previous slide, when you say that this money will be somehow located, it means that will be allocated to uh, um, fight against the COVID, correct? Exactly. So it's not exactly. allocated Thank to you. development of our sector of, or, uh, no, oh. correct? Okay. No, no, it's, uh, it's given to the government in the context of COVID to, I would say, to support the policies of the government. Which so this is an, 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 a crucial issue, you know, because we have money, but the yes. money that we have is allocated, obviously, for the emergency. And some countries, they are moving the budget they have dedicated to our industry to obviously fight this emergency. Okay. Exactly. So uh, that's a very good point, uh, Lugero. Actually, the money that is given, uh, it will be allocated uh, in various sectors of the economy, health sector and so on. And I'm going to come back to that in the next slides. So for the case of Burkina, there will be three areas of opportunities. And this money is going to go there. First, the health sector. And in the health sector, we have the issue of traditional knowledge. Because nowadays, all the African countries which are trying to find solutions are trying to see how we can use both uh, modern industry but also traditional industry to solve COVID-19. The second thing is gold. Why? Because as you can see, while the price of uh, oil is decreasing, the price of gold is increasing. So this can also be another way to support the government in order to increase resources to fight. Uh, because the main issue currently from the economic point of view is that COVID is actually depriving our governments from their sources of revenue. And last but not least, the energy. So um, if uh, our government in Burkina Faso has decided that uh, they will uh, make water and electricity free for uh, the bottom of the pyramid. And one of the best ways to do it is to actually increase solar energy. And as a matter of fact, Burkina Faso signed the, the solar, uh, International Solar Association, something like that, that they launched in India, uh, I think in 2018. Yes, yes. And Burkina yes, yes, exactly. And Burkina Faso has committed to increase the consumption of solar energy uh, up to 30% of the natural consumption. So I would like to conclude so that we can have time for questions and say that actually, from the economic point of view, we have bad news. The bad news are the decrease in oil prices, maybe, can be good news and bad news. The tourism sector, um, uh, my friend have already mentioned that, and also the crowding sector from the health sector because there will be too much focus on the health sector. However, the good news are that these are opportunities for our countries and regions. And for the case of West Africa 
at the level of ECOWAS, the Economic Community of West African States, which gathers 350 million people to develop indigenous development solutions, yes. and especially for the energy sector, and also the sector of remote working. And our conference is an example of that. And you can see that uh, even um, we are using uh, Zoom, and you all know that in the last couple of weeks, Zoom have improved tremendously. And last but not least, we have the IT for education, which is going to be, I think, another uh, great sector for, um, uh, for investment. So all in all, currently we will have a lot of money coming from multilateral and bilateral uh, uh, partners to finance our governments. So they need to uh, give a priority to build, operate, and transfer or to private public uh, partnerships because they would, we need uh, a change in paradigm going for example from physical workspace to virtual workspace and going from resource-based economies to value added or to knowledge-based economies. So this is what I wanted to share quickly with you. So thank you very much. I don't know if somebody has question to you, but what it is important is that actually at the end of the day, I think somehow uh, renewable energy can be rediscussed in the national industrial policies because I know according to what you're saying at the end of the day the question is that uh, countries can rediscuss how they approach uh, their approach in the industrial policy meaning that they can build up maybe new uh, capabilities in terms of enabling solutions new solutions for instance green hydrogen etc or, or other long-term structural structural shift towards a, a low carbon economy, right? Absolutely, absolutely. So I, I think that this is a, there is a need for a shift in paradigms. And as you know, within the context of climate change, uh, there was a, a demand and a call to shift from, uh, let's say, fossil, uh, fossil fuel to clean energy. And I think that this is the time now and you were talking about you know, the, the financing coming from multilateral, multilateral partners to our governments. Most of the money, and I could have shared with you one of the agreements between uh, the um, Development Bank of West Africa and the government of Burkina Faso, it really gives the government uh, uh, some space to really be creative about how they can use it. So this is the right time to rediscuss our uh, industrial policies, and I think that clean tech has something to play in. I'd like to thank you all of you for uh, amazing uh, discussion. We were recording this, so we'll put it also online and make it available to all the viewers. Yes, so thank you so much, and uh, let's uh, make Africa connected with all the world. Thank you so much, guys. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you very much.